I remember I wanted to walk to my, to my bed. And as I touched the bed, a power hit me from my bed to the corner of the hotel room. And I began to weep and I tried to lift my eyes and I could see a fire sitting on my bed. And it was burning that convicting pain out of you. I mean, you, you have such a fear of God that comes on you. It was fear that came on me. I thought if I get close to that bed, I'm finished, I'm dead. Welcome to Kingdom Unleashed, where we do an interview with a fivefold minister every month. So are there modern day prophets? Or did the prophetic gift pass away millennia ago? In this interview, you will hear the backstory of prophet Leon Tapria and how he came to Christ, encounters he had with God and angels and how the Lord called him to be a prophet. My prayer is that you would listen with a humble and hungry heart with eyes to see the hand of God upon his life. Let's dive in. Prophet Leon, it's uh, great to be with you here in Centurion, Johannesburg, South Africa, and it was wonderful to spend some time with you last night and hear a bit of your, your journey. It sounds like it's been an adventure, <laughs> your walk with the Lord. Yes. So great to have you uh, on the Kingdom Unleashed channel. No, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Pastor Andre. Appreciate it. It's an honor and excited to see what God is going to do and what yeah. comes out. And, yes, you know, the, amen. So now I'm excited. I often tell our guys at our church, there is more, <laughs> you mm. know, that um, as James 4 speaks about, you know, God gives more grace. Yes, there's, yes, there's, yes. there's always more. And I'm, I'm trusting that out of this interview, you know, people are going to experience the more. Yes, I, you know, yes, just listening yes, to your yes. stories last night even inspired me to like, there's more. Let's yes, pursue yes, yes. pursue that more. So I'm trusting for each one joining us on this interview that they, you, you guys are going to be inspired by by the stories and uh, Prophet Leon's journey. Yes. And uh, you know, so our mission on on this channel is to revive the church okay. and to unlock the fivefold. Yes, yes. And and for me, the key to reviving the the Church of Jesus Christ is to embrace the full fivefold. Absolutely. You know, like every one of the fivefold brings something else, another aspect of Jesus yes. to the church, you know. And so yes. I'm excited for this interview to see a bit more of Jesus yes. shining through you, you know, yes. Yes. into the into the body of Christ. And so we normally start off the, you know, I start off the interviews by getting the backstory out. We want to know yes. who you are and, and get context for your journey with the Lord. No so, problem. yeah, Prophet Leon, share a bit with us your, how do you get saved? What, how did yes. Jesus save you? Give us the backstory. Um, Pastor Andre, uh, thanks of all, obviously for having me on, and it is it's a real privilege. I'm now, <clears throat> I think around, um, you know, sometimes you forget your age when you're between 38 and 40, but around 39, I think I would say 39, I'm turning 40 this year. Um, yeah, I'm turning 40 this year. And, um, uh, uh, but I got saved when I was uh, 17 years old, 17 and a half years old. Uh, that was after kind of like a lifestyle of drugs and uh, living on the streets at certain point of times, uh, very rebellious, got expelled out of, out of school, uh, out of high school, um, lived just in a house with a lot of kids that was on drugs. I didn't have any religious background except for just being in a normal, uh, really strict denominational Afrikaans church in South Africa, but I had no concept of really who God is or um, who the Holy Spirit is, uh, any supernatural experience that was far beyond, that was far away from me. So I got saved, you know, we were uh, kind of like on a process where um, we were, um, uh, 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 we were on like a weekend of drinking and a weekend of just partying as, as like I said, you're young, you expelled of high school already, a lot of bad influences from friends on my life. And um, then uh, it was one night, I can't remember if it was a Saturday evening or a, it was a Sunday evening, exactly. I can actually remember the date. So 25th of August, uh, 2002, I believe 2002, 25th of August. And um, it was a Sunday night. And uh, we were at a house just just relaxing with a lot of friends there and getting up to what we shouldn't be out getting up to. And there comes a young man walking in. And I recognized him as my ex-drug dealer type person, as somebody that supplied to me a few years ago um, or, or maybe a year prior to that. And he came walking in and there was a light on him, a really strong light on him. Something was different. You can see it. And he came walking straight to me and my friends and began to minister to us uh, just 
evangelizing, witnessing, witnessing the gospel. And I was opposed to it. My friends were also a bit opposed to it, but he kept on, kept on, and he carried power on him. And, uh, you know, and I could feel that his words had power on it. And, and eventually he kept saying that, you know, I'm going to go to hell and so on, and I must give my life to Jesus Christ, but very passionately. And I, he asked if he could pray with me, and I said, that's fine, well, let's pray with you. And I was really meaning it in my heart. And as, I, as he prayed for me, the power of God um, came on me, you know, and hit me, and I woke up on the floor. Oh. And what I didn't know is that, yeah, he was my drug dealer, but in the interim, in the previous year, of, uh, last year that I haven't seen him in his life, he got saved, became a youth pastor at a church, and uh, he heard something that happened with us with one party, and then he, he just... After church was Sunday evening. When he was done with church, he just thought he's going to come into our house and minister to us. So, oh, um, awesome. you know, and because of him, I'm saved today. So I remember yeah. walking out of that encounter. My life was never the same again. I had the Holy Spirit inside of me, you know. So when I walked out of there, all of a sudden, I heard a voice from that day always speaking inside of me. And I believe it's part of the prophetic as well. That voice would direct me, that voice would guide me. Um, in the prophetic, that voice would get stronger and obviously it'll get to visionary, audible, uh, auditory and so on voices. And we'll get into that later in the interview. But um, uh, that, that voice began to tell me how to read the Bible. It's like, you, you know, it's the witness of the Holy Ghost. It's that voice. And you just, it's a genuine salvation. I don't know how to explain. You just, I rem remember went home that night and you become the first step of the salvation is the curiosity of things. Nobody told me to read a Bible. I just, something tell me, I must read my Bible. You know, yeah, I was, awesome. let me say, someone tell me, you know, nobody told me how to pray. Something told me I must, I must pray, you know, and didn't even know how to pray, didn't know how to sit and uh, anything like that. But there was a curiosity to spiritual things and to the things of the Lord very specifically. And I began opening up a Afrikaans 19, what is it, 16, 11 or 19, the old for Tallinn, you know, uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> open up that Bible and uh, didn't really understand much, but I read, I read, I read, didn't understand much, but it was just the spirit of God in me because the word is alive. Even if you don't understand what you're reading in the word, just the fact that you read it, the word is alive. You know, I believe it's alive. So there are a lot of different ways to meditate upon the word, but I was just reading it so the word could come into me because I had the author, you know, in my life. So, so you had a is, hunger, you had yeah. a hunger for God and yeah. hunger for his word and so that is how I got saved. And, and so obviously you cleaned up your life, you know? Immediately with, you know, with the with a, with a, um, exception of, with small things like um, smoking, for example, was difficult. It took me two months, you know, but when somebody got me, I mean, I knew it was wrong, but uh, when I was in a home cell and so on, people challenged me and challenged me and, and I felt the Holy Spirit. And then I would just, the one day I remember, I just, I just quit, you know? So it was about two months into my salvation. And... Um, but all the other things, I stopped immediately. I had an encounter with God. Yeah. And, uh, but nobody told me it was, maybe I did some of it. I can't even remember still because you, you'd, oh yes, let me tell you this funny story. So I, did, I didn't know what was right or wrong. You, you just get saved, you know, you don't know what's right or wrong. So the week after I'm saved, I'm like, I'm going to go out to a nightclub and, you know, get my drink and so on because yes. you don't know what is wrong. I didn't have parents that could tell me this is right or wrong. So I go to the nightclub and um, I remember you had like this night where, big night where everybody just can drink as much as you want, you know. And uh, I went there and I went to the bar and I got my glass. And halfway as I was walking and I was trying to drink, this voice was screaming in me. He said, this is not the place for you. This is not what I have for you. Mm. You know, and I remember I was so frustrated. I just gave my glass back and I irritated, left. And that is how my relationship with God developed. And that is how I know that I was genuinely saved, mm. you know. Uh, it's yeah, the witness beautiful. of the Holy Spirit. I yeah. don't see that often in today's time. I see mm. people still like going to clubs and it's okay for them. And there's no convicting voice voice you know even after they come to church so uh yeah i never had i had the convicting power of the holy spirit no, that's beautiful to me and uh, you know yeah no, that's beautiful the holy spirit convicts us of our sins and yes. convinces us of our righteousness, our righteousness. yes Amen. in god and it sounds like you know that you've always been a full-on kind of guy so before christ you were full full on going mm. for the world and after coming to christ you've been full on for christ eh? yes yes yeah no definitely from there straight there i just went into ministry you know, 100%. So, okay, that's uh, awesome. Okay, yes. so, so uh, I mean, you functioning as a prophet today. So take us down a bit of that, that journey of discovering that, you know, in terms of the fivefold that you carry a prophetic mantle and, and, and take us down some of that, that journey, maybe some of the encounters with mm. God, those moments that you realize there's more than just the, the, the ordinary uh, mm. resting upon your life. Yeah. Um, when I got saved, obviously there was that hunger. And um, 
about a month or so after my salvation, I begin to get more into the word. And, and I remember reading Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, 1 verse 5. And as I was reading, I didn't know what a prophet was. I didn't know what an evangelist was. I really, I came out of old staunch Afrikaans denominationalism. Um, uh, got into a church. I want to make that clear. Got into a church. I mean, she served in that church, worked full time in that church. And, but um, the first month I wasn't in a church yet, you know, but I was just ministering full time. I was getting all my friends saved and ministering to them. So we began to see stuff already like evangelism very strong in my life. I would just, I get to as many friends as I can, you know, to try to get them saved. Um, then began to see demon manifestations, those type of things, but I didn't know what was going on again. I would really came out of no knowledge. And at those days, not a lot of people knew. So not a lot of people knew what a prophet was in those days, or at least the circles that I was dwelling in. But the Lord spoke to me very clearly about a month in after my salvation when I was reading Jeremiah 1 verse 5 and going from there for onward where he says that, Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, our danger is a prophet to the nations. And, you know, um, you shall break down, uh, root out, build up and, uh, uh, you know, he gave me that call and he says, even do not be dismayed by their faces, don't be worried by your age. And, 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 the, and as I was reading that, the Holy Spirit said to me, I've placed a prophetic calling upon your life. And it was very subtle at that time, because again, you don't really know much, you know, but um, then the gift began to come. So the gift was the clear thing for me. Um, I was just drawn towards the prophetic. I could prophesy to people. Uh, whenever I would pray for someone, I'd be able to, I would naturally prophesy to them. And, um, that was the beginning. How I got that encounter, I want to say to you this, what happened is I wasn't just reading it, it popped out. I was in my room and I was really, I don't know if I was partially fasting at that time. It was very long ago, but I was definitely reading the word, spending a lot of time with God. And um, I was sitting on my bed. And as I sat on my bed uh, with my Bible, I felt a person walking into the room. And um, sitting right next to me on the bed and I could feel, you could feel like the bed going in. And it was like the word just became open to me. You know, that was where God began to speak to me about Jeremiah 1 verse 5 and so on. And then I read, then somebody introduced me to, to the book called Good Morning Holy Spirit. And I remember reading that and that really touched me. And I was like, but that's it. I had a similar experience where this person walked in. You know, when you're young, you can't say it is an angel definitively. Or you can't, if you don't have any Christian background, you can't say this is the Holy Spirit. You just know someone godly walked in, whether it's the Holy Spirit, whether it's Jesus, whether it's, you know, and, um, but I just spent so much time with God. Those, encount those type of encounters kind of like became normal. Um, then I became so radical that, that um, what I thought is normal, realized it was not normal out there with a lot of Christians, mm. you know? So I just had encounters with God really almost every day, seeking him, hungry for him. His, pre his presence would be a norm to me. His glory would be all the time there, but it became a, uh, I thought other people experienced it. So when I would go to other Christians and to churches, I realized they didn't have the hunger or the fire. But that's how the prophetic call initially started. And then obviously a bit later on, which I'll get later on to the testimony, is when I had an angelic encounter, especially regarding the prophetic. And um, and how the Lord just always had me with prophets to be trained up. Okay, that's cool. So obviously there was a stirring in you and then you started to get exposure to, to other prophetic voices mm. as well. And, and, and you grew and learn. So I was uh, always trained under prophet, you know? Um, okay. uh, so when I got saved, I was um, working as a young person in the church up here uh, where I live in Centurion. And then, um, then the Lord said to me to move to Mshlanga. So I moved to Mshlanga and there uh, I was part of a ministry, uh, a prophet that became my spiritual father. He was very well known in the country during that time. And yeah, he raised me up. I was living on the street, I was in my car there, actually in Mshlanga. And uh, I was just hungry. I just wanted to be by the church and pray. And uh, so I was there every prayer meeting in the mornings. And he basically took me in, into his house, into the ministry, began to mentor me. And so I went through the ranks of the church, you know, when I was very young, at age 19, 20, 21. And uh, I was raised up to as an assistant, then youth pastor, then associate pastor, and went further like that, and then into itinerant ministry until we started our own ministry. But so the prophetic, and then the prophetic office always rested on me. You know, I kind of like, I want to say it like this, I always knew just only the prophetic. I knew evangelism, the prophetic. So I was a revivalist and the prophetic. So, but the Lord spoke to me, Jeremiah 1 verse 5, that was the initial call. Then I had some encounters later on. The clear cut one came with an angel that did visit me. Um, and then obviously, you know, I believe even though we are called of God, we need to be affirmed by man or, or uh, you know, like a confirmation. Yeah, confirmation a must. Yeah. You can obviously be used by God outside, yes. of, outside of man's approval, but to be accepted by the church 
as a whole and as the larger body of Christ. You know, men and other prophets or apostles, I believe fully have to confirm and witness that uh, call and the gift on your life. And when they do that, it's just an approval kind of like for the church to say, yes. you yeah, know, that's good. we have seen the gift. So I've gone through all of those things, yeah. Okay, and so some of your encounters, I mean, uh, was, as, we, as you shared with me, at times you've seen angels. So maybe take us down some of those encounters that you, you experienced, like even as a young man. Mm. Um, so I want to make it clear before I get into that is, you know, um, I had angelic visitations, but before I had that, I was, I was so into with the word. You know, I, um, I prayed through the nights, studied the word through the nights, memorized chapters at a time. So the word was in me, I believe, the word is a very good measuring and guiding stick for encounters that a person will have. So every encounter that I had, I try to measure it against the word. I try Amen. to hold it against the word. Yes. And um, uh, you know, I don't believe it must steer outside of the word of, uh, I'm sure there's stuff, there's encounters, and you know, this is not really for public consumption, but I believe there's encounters we can have that we can't find the word because the word doesn't limit God. It yes. expresses God. Yes. And we must make that very clear. The word doesn't limit God, it expresses God. I had encounters you can't find in the Bible, but it must not oppose the Bible. Yes. You know, so that it mustn't contradict what scripture. You can't have an encounter that says divorce your wife. You know, it's it's contradicting yes. scripture. Yes. Um so that is very clear for me. But yeah, the encounter side, man, I mean, we can we can talk. I you know, I know people, a lot of ministers will say, you should only have one. These people that have many encounters, be careful of them. No, you know, um, look at Paul's encounters, look at Jesus' encounters, look at everybody's encounters. So if you want to speak Bible, yes, Jesus will reveal himself to you. Not to all, um, not to everyone, you know, uh, in terms of a personal encounter. He usually only reveals himself personally to those who are called to the apostolic or the prophetic um, as the office gifts. And, um, uh, but what was my encounters was. So maybe before you get into it, um, just for those at home as well, you know, if God is real, you know, demons are real and then angels must be real, you know? So it's important for us to see in the book of Acts and all through scripture, we see angelic, partnership in a sense that wherever God was moving, there will be angels, you know, with Peter in jail. And there's so many, many uh, examples mm. of angelic visitations. Mm. And, and, and I, I enjoy, or I, 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 for me, these stories are important because it, it reveals the reality of God, you know, whether it's a demon manifesting for me, it reveals, ultimately reveals the reality of Jesus because he comes and he delivers, mm -hmm. you know, same with the angels or angelic visitations ultimately points us to the one who Jesus. is the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord over, he's the commander of the, the host of heaven. Yes. But I know it's, it, it stirs people's faith. And yes. I, I had a, f a feeling like this, the Lord says to me like this year, there will be people experiencing divine encounters, like mm -hmm. an angel coming in during your prayer time, an angel coming in and, 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 and people encountering more of God ultimately. Yes. You know, so I want you to share some of the stories because the, st the stories stir faith and, mm -hmm. and, and, and ultimately points to us, to the so, reality so of God. Yes. And, and, um, you know, every encounter, every, every experience that a person has, I believe has to point towards Christ. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to have the words of Christ in it, but it has to point you towards Christ. You know, it has to draw you closer to it. It mustn't draw you away from him. And now you're completely fascinated with a certain sign or a wonder. And yes. that is very important. So, you know, the Holy Spirit, every, sorry, every manifestation of the Holy Spirit will always give witness to Jesus. You know, the Bible Amen. says the Holy Spirit gives a witness, he honors, he gives witness to Jesus. Jesus witnesses to the Father. So he gives witness to the, he points to the Father. So Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father, you know? So, but if we've seen the Holy Spirit, we've seen Jesus. So if people want to know Jesus, get to know the Holy Spirit. Okay. If you want to know the Father, read the gospels. And that's, that's my, that's my philosophy on that. Well, truth. Amen. And, um, but the encounters. So, so the encounters, um, look, I believe the measure of encounters you have determines the measure of grace that you carry and it increases the measure of grace. The Bible says that uh, grow in grace. You know, we can all increase in grace and grow in grace. And I saw one of your questions was on the increase in the anointing, increase in grace. And we'll get into that in the interview, but there's no scripture actually that says you can increase in the anointing. It's only scriptures that says you can increase in grace. So a lot of people are like, I want to increase the anointing. No, the anointing is in you. It's in you. You now need to learn how to release it. You need to learn how to grow in grace and faith to act and to and to demonstrate that. So, but I believe the measure of encounters that a person have and the type of encounters they have determines the grace upon their lives and it increases the dimension of grace. Um, so not everybody's called to be a prophet, uh, 
so Jesus isn't going to come personally to every single person, you know, but if Jesus comes to you personally, say, there's a grace on your life to do something, you know, I see it always as a, as a, as a corporate type setting. I see the, I see the kingdom of God as a corporate type setting. The CEO doesn't, or the owner doesn't just see if, if he has a 500 employee company, he doesn't see every employee. He doesn't go and spend time the whole day standing by the receptionist and talking, you know, he's got protocol through. So that is why God uses angels. So that is a whole nother subject. That is his workforce, you know? So a lot of people are against angels, but that is God's workforce. You're not gonna just see God or see Jesus. It'll most of the time be angels. So when it comes to, when it comes to encounters, very first, I mean, I had many encounters, but I'm just gonna give you some, what I feel really stood out for us, you know? And, um, really stood out for us. Um, I had that one, which I told you about in, in, in my room. I, I had, uh, an encounter. I was about 21 years old. I was sitting with, um, this church where I told you at in Mshlanga at a big team meeting and, um, uh, a lot of people were there and I felt this didn't, couldn't see fully. But I felt this being walking in and standing right next to me. It was that time. Now I'll get into more descriptive angelic encounters. But this one was, was like a translucent being. And I felt oil coming on my head. It was like this, this goosebumps going over my head. Now we're in a staff meeting with a church. The prophet was my spiritual father at the time is there. And no one here is seeing it. And all of a sudden he looked and he said, Leon, there's an angel standing next to you, pouring the word into you your head and I'm standing and I'm saturated with the anointing you know as I sit there and so you can feel something's happening there oh yeah I mean I could see a being it's yeah. just translucent mm -hmm. and I could feel hot oil being poured out on my head you know obviously I believe it was God anointing me he said it, the word was poured out that's what he saw you know now uh, I was just sitting and, and receiving you know as I was sitting there it was another first and um and, yeah. and what, what is good about that is also is that the the prophet or the your spiritual father, he saw it as well, you know? Mm, mm, mm. And so that confirmation, because you were seeing something, you were experiencing something, and there was somebody else who, in a, I mean, a staff meeting, seeing the same, confirming the reality of what you were experiencing. Yes, yes. And I like that, because sometimes I mean, some people see angels behind every bush and they're like, uh, I'm not so sure. So the confirmation is is beautiful to, to, to hear. Uh, we can maybe touch on something like spiritualized in the interview if you want. You know, a lot of people are confused with this. So a lot of people, you get the flaky that just see everything everywhere, but you have different levels of vision. So you have a hazon vision, you have an inner vision, open vision, closed vision, but then you have a Mara vision, M-A-R-A -A, in the Hebrew, it's called Mara. Whenever Mara was word, the Hebrew word Mara was used. It was, you see it in Daniel's life being used. So you see Daniel going from, I might just uh, not remember correctly, but where Daniel started getting visions, I believe it was Daniel six, I'm not correctly sure. But when he first had visions, it was Hazon, it was open vision. And then he would see a vision, but it didn't affect the others around him. It was only him that was seeing it. But once you had Daniel 8, Daniel 8 or 9, I'm speaking under correction, just for the sake of time. When you look at Daniel 8 or 9, you see the Hebrew word changing to Mara. But that, what happened, you would see a vision and then you would look and people around them would be on the floor or they would be trembling or they would, they would experience something, but they couldn't fully exactly see. We see the same with Paul yes. on the road of Damascus. We mm. see the same with, with uh, Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Father speaking to him and uh, Peter James and John seeing, seeing the same there, you know, experiencing yes. the same. So you have a level. So a vision never starts where everybody else experiences it. So it depends. Uh, I wouldn't always put it that everybody must see it or there must be a confirmation because God will speak to you as an inner vision. Inner vision is like it's in your heart, but you see it as a projector screen going over over people. And it's like no one else sees what you are seeing, but you're seeing it, you know, but it's very dangerous just to, I mean, you must know encounter must become doctrine to you, you know, but um, yeah, so that was the one encounter. Another, But encounter. as you said, in those encounters, it's like a, God releases something into somebody's life. You know, like I said, you, yes. you, there's a, and, and I agree in my own life, encounters have, it, it, it brings a shift yes. in one's life, in one's walk with God. Yes. Every encounter, um, I believe God is there to deposit something into you, you know, download, deposit something into you. And um, another encounter I had was, was, uh, I'm trying to get them in the right time frame because it was like, I'm trying to see which one I can give you as the best. I'm um, trying to do in time. I was ministering. I had a lot of encounters, which is normal for, for, for any prophet, but, but most people should have encounters. I was in the country of Namibia. We had a revival there. And as I'm in the nation of Namibia, we, uh, we, um, I was alone there first. We did two trips there. The second one brought great revival. The first one I was alone. Went alone. I was preaching in this church. And as I preached in this church, 
big church. Um, I was just done preaching a normal message. And I didn't think anything. It was like a, in the middle of a message, like a waterfall break out in the middle of the auditorium. When I say waterfall, it, it felt like a waterfall of glory falling. And people began to scream and fall under the power. I'm just preaching. And they so you saw, forward. did you see that in the spirit, the waterfall? No, it felt like a waterfall. Okay, you felt, it okay. felt, it felt like, like particles of God falling on me. You're mm. not out. It's like little things of the glory falling on you. The anointing, tangible, it's so mm. tangible, it feels like you can pick it up. And it fell in the church. And I looked at this and people were just going crazy. It was one of the main churches in the area and they were going crazy. Eventually they began to carry people from the back to the front that was manifesting. Uh, to do deliverance on them and so on. One person tried to run out and kill themselves or you know, cut themselves with a knife. They brought them in, laid hands on them. They got delivered and it really got, it was so hectic. They were screaming for two hours. I just packed up my stuff. I left, I said to the pastor, look, uh, you know, it feels like it's it's God doing it. I'm not gonna push, I mean, what must I preach now? You know, I still have tomorrow night and the night they off the left. And uh, I remember coming out of that encounter, I mean, I was also on the floor there, but we went to my hotel room to pick up the keys for the first time. As I got to the lady, who's an unbeliever, big hotel there in Namibia, I asked her, can I please, you know, my room keys, I'm sure to pick up the room keys. And as she gave me the room keys, she's like, starts trembling. It's like, what, what is this? What is this? I said, just give me, I'm tired now. I'm like, just give me my room key. <laughs> you know, I know it's the anointing. And I can feel it going off me onto her. And she begins to say, I said, it's a shake. I said, it's the presence, it's the presence of God. I just came out of a meeting and I said, you can come to church and so on. But I took that key and I'm getting to the encounter store. And I went into my room and as I opened the door to get into my room, I walked into my bedroom. My computer is usually on my bed if I, if, if I don't use it in a service. It's on my bed. And um, I remember wanting to walk to my, to my bed. And as I touched the bed, a power hit me from my bed to the corner of the hotel room. And I began to weep and I tried to lift my eyes and I could see a fire sitting on my bed. And it was burning that convicting pain out of you. I mean, you, you have such a fear of God that comes on you. It was fear that came on me. I thought if I get close to that bed, I'm finished, I'm dead. And I tried to, I tried to get close because it was going like an hour in, I was just weeping and weeping, try to get close and I couldn't, it feels like my heart starts beating and I would get a heart attack or like a hand is on my heart like that. And I got to the corner of the room again. And I was very sickly in my body during that time also, you know, very sickly. And, um, and I heard a voice coming out of this fire. It was an internal voice in here. So I couldn't say it's an audible voice that anybody could have heard, but there was a fire on my bed. And this voice said, I, will, I wanna use you for my glory, for greatness but I cannot do it if your body is unhealthy, you know? And then it went away and everything was away. It was like normal. Mm. And I was very, I wasn't, I was very sick, you know, there, um, very sick. I battled with a lot of things in my body. Um, uh, even from before my salvation, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, you're cursed now. No, 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 it was from before my salvation. And the next night revival exploded in the nation. We went back and got my team, went for, and we had revival going throughout the whole nation. We had 20,000 salvations in like 12 days or something like that. Sure. Almost in every church, people drove hours and hours and packed up the churches. And that was the immediate result of that encounter, you know, but there I knew I need to get my body right. Then it just went from bad to worse with my body. But now, you know, the last few years we, we got it right. But that word has never left me. And it was kind of like a warning that the Lord was saying, you, you the, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes. We are carriers of the glory. If you're sick, you can't be used. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it can't be used, but people understand what I'm saying. And if you, 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 I believe our body must be healthy. Our spirit must be healthy. Our soul must be healthy. We prosper as our soul prospers. So yeah. that was another encounter. Then I had more intense encounters as it got, went mm -hmm. on and on. You know, another one, just for the sake of timing to see if I can get it in. Uh, another one was when we planted the church. So we went, I turned ministry a revival ministry all over the nation and other nations. And um, I was just sitting in my office, just sitting, not praying, not fasting. And all of a sudden I was in another realm, another time. I was walking automatically. I was just walking through this field of this long grass, beautiful grass. And I was holding someone's hand and I was walking, I looked tall person. And I, I say this to provoke and some sensationalism, but avatar tall, okay, like that tall. If I can give somebody an indication, mm. literally that tall, I to look up like this, but a beautiful man walking, no hair, Beautiful man walking, you know, smiling at me, shining, strange body, strange, strange body. But it was peace all over. And this angel, which I believe it was, and I believe that's an angel that was assigned to my ministry because every time we plant a church, that same angel is present. And I can get into those testimonies. And I, and I always back this stuff up with a word. But this angel said to me, 
I want you to plant, I want you to stop doing itinerant. We had a conversation first. It was like an unknown conversation. I couldn't really fully understand, but we were talking. But then what was revealed to me was when he said the words, he said, he said, I want you to stop itinerant ministry. Don't do the crusade that you're planning and plant a church on the 18th of September, a church of the supernatural. And that's it. And I came out of that vision and I was sitting on my desk. I was like, what happened? So I looked at the date. I saw the third, 18th, whatever they said was, was 18 was a Sunday. I went to my team. I merely told them, listen, this, I had this encounter. I would not lie about this, but I had this encounter. And um, uh, in fact, if you would, otherwise you can cut this out, but if you would, um, we can maybe show photos of Angel that, when we were in our prayer meeting. So I have the photos. That same angel that came to me was happening in our prayer meeting with, with our team. They also, I showed it to our church, you know, real photos, that real photos that we took. And um, uh, yeah, so I told my team, that it was just a small team of eight people. And that, um, that uh, you know, we're going to plant a church. People emptied their accounts, people into their retirement annuities. People came, but they just got saved. A day or two got saved, came and gave the card to us like this and said, go sell it for the church. So within a month, we could plant the church fully paid off. Yeah. And uh, then the church just exploded. Obviously, I got my, I got my um, approval from my oversight. Mm -hmm. You know, I sent them, I told them the encounter that I had, but I said, I'll never go without their blessing. That was the end of my email. They responded back and some of them very strong men of God, you know, um, in the nation, some of them said, uh, well, all of them said, Leon, you encountered an angel that is, that is shifting the next season of your life and for ministry. You know, this is of Amen. God. Amen. We got our blessings. So that was, that was a very big encounter. Mm. And then it got bigger and bigger and bigger from yes. the moment on in meetings. So yeah, I, I, it's, it's great to, to, to hear those, those, those encounters. Now, uh, Leon, I mean, it's, again, the, the, the reality of the encounters for me is in the fruit of it. You know, so you, you had these encounters and the result was say 20,000 people come to Christ in Namibia or mm. the result is you plant a church and there's provision. And, you know, so, so God uses, um, I mean, a variety of means to, to bring his provision and his grace into our lives and angels are one of those mm. ways that he does that. So that's really inspiring. And I, and I just want to say for, for all of us listening, I believe that as uh, Prophet Leon is sharing this, you know, he's releasing grace for, for all of us to encounter more, ultimately more of Jesus. That's the, that's the main focus of having more of Christ in our lives. So thanks for that. We're going to continue in the next session. We're going to uh, unpack more of, uh, of your awesome. journey in God. Thanks so much. Awesome. That was inspiring. I love hearing people's encounters with God and the angelic realm. Why is the prophetic so important? We need a move of God to flood the nations. We need every gift and provision that God has made available to us to see his kingdom come. So let's pursue them all. In the next session, Prophet Leon shares about the opposition they've experienced, how Satanists came against them and how the Lord defends his anointed. Click on the end screen icon for session two.